Ignatius Press and the Augustine Institute present The Formed Book Club. Catholic book lovers unpacking good books chapter by chapter. If you like us, please help us by subscribing and by reviewing us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you might listen. And don't forget to sign up for weekly updates and study questions at formedbookclub.ignatius.com. We are the Form Book Club, or at least we are the three who discuss the book, and hopefully you people can join us in reflecting on these books. We begin a new book today by Henri de Lubac, Jesuit, became a cardinal, called The Church, Paradox and Mystery. And uh, I will probably even uh, surpass myself in wanderings and mumblings and reflections because he was my mentor uh, in France back in 1969 and 1972. I knew him very well. I became actually his secretary for a while, uh, kind of informally. He's a great man of the church, a wonderful judge, a great human being. Uh, and I think with Ratzinger and Balthasar will one day be seen as fathers of the church of the 20th century. This is his book, The Church, Paradox, and Mystery. A little background. These are basically talks he gave or, or essays he wrote in 1966, one year after the council, Second Vatican Council ended. And there, his reflection on the council. And it's specifically on Lumen Gentium, the doctrine on the church of the council, uh, one of the four major dogmatic constitutions. And... If you go to Lumen Gentium and look at the table of contents, and then you go to another book by Father Dubac, whoops, here, called The Splendor of the Church, which was written before, it's actually a little bit of a more uh, colorful title. In French, it was Meditation, so they did Meditation on the Church. Uh, but I want to begin this reflection with my one of my very few writings, and one of which I'm very proud of. I wrote a little dedication in this book. We published it in uh, 1986, and I wrote this in the front matter. This re-edition is dedicated to Cardinal de Lubac in the year of his 90th birthday. My personal debt of gratitude to this extraordinary scholar, loyal churchman, gracious and patient teacher, and fellow Jesuit is but a small part of what is owed him by the countless numbers of men and women of every land whose faith has been so profoundly enriched by his life's work. Carlo de Lubac is above all else a man of the church, homo ecclesiasticus, such as he himself portrays in these pages. He has received all from the church, he's returned all to the church. This book, which characteristically he solemnly describes in his introduction, is a testament which will endure to his lifelong love of his mother and ours, the Immaculate Bride of the Lamb, Holy Church. So I, I think that well introduces this book on the church, which comes late, much later in his life. But I think we're, you know, we're used to thinking theologians as scholarly, which is correct, uh, often rather abstruse, uh, but you don't feel the heart beating, you know, whereas this book you do. Yes, you do. Vivian? Well, I, I was hoping you'd add a little bit about de Lubac. Um, for example, the fact that he was at the Battle of Verdun in World War One, and uh, was injured, had a traumatic head injury, seriously injured in that battle. Uh, he was part of the French resistance during the Nazi occupation of uh, France. And so uh, this is a man who, uh, this is a great man. Uh, and every measure of, uh, you know, great man, great heart, great mind, great soul, great courage, um, Yes, and interestingly, <laughs> Jesuits normally have a two-year novitiate, which is somewhat longer than other novitiates in some other orders. 
but he was in office for seven years because uh, he entered the Jesuits a year before World War I started. And then as a novice, he was, you know, uh, inducted into the French military, and he served there for five years during World War I, and then he came back and uh, finished his second novitiate. So he was the longest novitiate probably in the Jesuit history. But because of this injury, uh, he was not able to attend classes during philosophy and part of theology. And so what he did in his convalescence, he read the entire Patrologia Latina and Greca, that is the patrology of this famous scholar of Menia in the 19th century. So he read all the fathers of the church, the Latin fathers, the Greek fathers. Uh, and it just, it just shows not as much in this book, which are lectures he gave, you don't see all the footnotes. If you take any of his other books, like I'll just pick a page at random. You probably can't see it on the screen there. But this, this page, the text goes down to here, and the footnotes go from there. And he's quoting, I mean, he quotes Augustine and Aquinas and Origen and so on. But he's also quoting, I don't know, uh, Faustus of Ries and uh, Diognetus and people people never heard of. I mean, this man basically Im immersed himself in the whole history of the church. And then you, you see that in his writings. Yes. And you would think that after this uh, uh, introduction, it would be surprising to know that he has his detractors. And they often point to the fact that there was a time when he was silenced by the church. Father, would you like to comment on that? Yes. Uh, he, after, well, during the Second World War, he was working on a book called Surnatural, the Supernatural. And uh, it was basically an attempt, I think successful, to show that some more contemporary ways of presenting Thomas Aquinas had been rigidified and made into manuals, you know, and theses and so on. But the real Thomas Aquinas was much more rich, and he was one who brought together the whole patristic tradition, especially with respect to the relation between nature and grace. Well, this uh, disturbed certain Dominicans in Rome, and they... Uh, they prevailed upon the Pope to go to the Jesuit general and tell Father de Lubac he could no longer teach or write. He was not teaching at the time. They didn't even know that. And so from 47 to 48, well, another problem was this was he wrote the book right after the war and the, uh, there was a paper shortage like we're having now. Uh, and so this book was published. The first half was on one kind of paper. The second half on another, because he couldn't get enough good paper to do the book. Uh, so it wasn't that widely circulated. Uh, but he was told by his, by his prevent, by the Jesuit general, no longer to teach her right, which he accepted. And then a few years later, he was told, well, uh, you can't write on the Orthodox religion, but you can write on the unorthodox ones, the heter her her heretical ones. So he wrote three books on Buddhism, which are quite well, well regarded. And then we'll see this, we'll see some quotes into Terre de Chardin. Terre de Chardin was kind of a, a, a Jesuit, an anthropologist or archeologist, and also a, kind of a poetic philosopher. Uh, but he was not allowed to publish his writings until, until he died, and then his sister published what was there. In any event, uh, the Jesuit provincial, uh, tasked Father de Lubac with defending uh, Terje Chardin, who was a friend of de Lubac. And my view, which I think is the correct view, of course, is that Terje Chardin was neither the Messiah of the progressive movement, nor was he the heretic as seen by the traditionalists. But he was someone trying to reconcile uh, modern developments in science and archaeology and biology with the Catholic faith, and because he was not allowed to publish what he wrote, he didn't have the interchange with other scholars, which would have helped to correct him. So de Lubac took upon himself the task of showing what Terre was actually doing 
and criticizing what was there to be criticized, but also showing the, the deep faith that Tehran had. Uh, so it was only then after that that he was kind of rehabilitated, Lubak was. And then in 1962, he became a paritis at the Second Vatican Council. That was probably the most important figure in drafting and reworking the doctrine of the Church of the Magentum, which, which this is a commentary on. And then he be, was named a cardinal. He was named a cardinal. So that was a Dumbo full, II, a full yeah. exoneration occurred. Yeah. Um, and in fact, when uh, I was very pleased to see uh, when John Paul II was uh, elected pope, uh, his first encyclical was Redemptor Hominis. And in papal encyclicals, you normally are quoting either previous church documents or Fathers of the Church or Thomas Aquinas. But there were two living authors that were quoted and footnoted in John Paul II's first encyclical, Henri de Lubac and Hans von Balthasar. And but during I, that... Say, go ahead. I was going to say one more go little ahead. addendum. Go. While Please. he was under this order of no teaching, no writing, or whatever, he was obedient. He was fully obedient. Yes. That's right. And that's also a sign of tremendous holiness to when you obey your superiors, even when they're wrong and you know they're wrong. And not only obedient, but I, I, I studied at Fouvier in France, where he was there in residence, and people there who had been in residence with him during the time that he was told not to teach or to write anymore. And... Uh, I was told, uh, given a first-hand account of this story, uh, in France, at least at the time, it was customary uh, for the Jesuit residents. They would, after lunch, we'd go down into the basement common room and have a little demitasse, which was like coffee that was about the, uh, the consistency of used mortar oil. I mean, it was just dark and thick and viscous. But you, you, you put this cube of sugar in the middle of it, and then you sip the thing. Uh, but when this had happened, uh, there was great consternation among the faculty, there, and they were criticizing the Pope, saying, how could he do this? How could he allow this to happen to Father Dubac? And Father Dubac left the room and said, I cannot have you speak about the Pope in this way in my presence. Yep. And... He didn't write the book, Splendor of the Church, during that time, but he was allowed to give talks, which he did. And then when he was rehabilitated, he published those talks on the Splendor of the Church. Yep. Great man. A great man. Joseph, you were going to say yeah, something? Yeah, well, basically, right? what, what I, I see myself up to a point uh, in persona audience here. Um, uh, in in the sense that, as I've, as you've heard me say numerous times over the two or three years we've been doing this, I'm not a theologian. So Andre de Lubac is someone I know of uh, as 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 someone he I see quoted in other things, but I've never read him. I know vir virtually nothing about him. And of course, one thing that I, that I am is a biographer, so I've very much enjoyed getting the missing pieces of the puzzle, which was most of the pieces in my case, <laughs> put in place. So I actually now know the man and his story much better. I do have two questions, however, um, uh, just to fill the gaps in. So when was he made a cardinal and when did he die? He died in 1988, I believe. Uh, made a, 91. Oh, 91. That was the Balthazar in 88. That's right. 91. Made a, when was he made a cardinal, Thomas? <laughs> in the 80s at some point. Yeah, late 80s, something like that, yeah. Yeah, I know. I, again, I didn't. I knew nothing about, obviously, anything about him much at all about his bi biographical details. But both of my grandfathers fought in World War One, so there's automatically a, an affinity when I hear that someone fought in the Battle of Verdun and was and was wounded. I mean, that in itself uh, speaks to here. Anyway, a book of his, Joseph, that you would really probably treasure is his drama of atheistic humanism where he goes through all of the 20th century ideologies, 19th, 19th century ideologies, in, and in on into the 20th century, but beginning earlier, and looks at all of them, Marx and, and, and Comte. And, the, the, the three main 
are, are Marx, Comte, and Nietzsche. Those are the three main. And he says in the 19th century, there was no response from the intellectual except from Dostoevsky. Yes. And so this, this is a reflection on Dostoevsky's novels yes. as a response to the idea of a humanism without God. Yep. By the way, that's a book we might want to discuss. That, that, that is a phenomenal book. It is a phenomenal book. Who already know from, from, just from the two of you giving me uh, the uh, the nutshell uh, that it's a book I want to read. So if we're going to discuss it, that's my excuse to read it. So I would certainly be in favor of that. Okay, okay. good. Let's put it on the list. Uh, 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 another thing, uh, what are we talking about? Just before that, we mentioned something about the uh, When he died, when he was made a cardinal. Made a cardinal. Oh, oh yes, uh, because I mean, I can't exactly say we were friends because uh, he was fifty years older than I am, you know, was. <laughs> uh, but we certainly became very close to, together. He he really, you know, gave himself to me and gave me so much. But so whenever I I would go to Europe and go through France, I would stop to see him. So uh, one of these uh, trips I took years ago. Uh, I had a, you know, a day over in France, in Paris, and so I always go to Notre Dame because that's just such a phenomenal place. But I, I went up to his room, and at that time he was living in Rue de Sèvres, a Jesuit residence in Paris. And uh, I went in, we're talking to him. Oh, actually, <laughs> uh, because I took a, a, a red eye flight, I had to say mass, and he had a little chapel off his room. And so I asked him if I could see Mass in his chapel. He said, yes, he was fine. Uh, and so I said Mass in. He, Cardinal Dubach, served my Mass on his knees. And he was in his 70s or 80s, you know. Now I'm starting to get for class. But, but then, huh, then after we're talking after the Mass in his little, little office there, and he has to go to the bathroom. And so why he's in the bathroom, I look at his bookshelf, and there's this dossier. The French have these little kind of, they're kind of a orangish, grayish kind of a cover that you have your middle envelopes and things like that. And I saw a papal correspondence. So, oh, what's in, what's in there? So while he's in the bathroom, I quickly look at this. Oh, Father, you didn't. I did, yeah. And uh, I have this correspondence with him and John Paul too. Oh, my goodness. And uh, it's so beautiful. Uh, how, the great respect that, that John, John Paul II had for the Dubac. In fact, I was uh, a lot of stories here. I'm sorry about this, but uh, no, this is wonderful. Uh, this is oral history right here, folks. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah, you bet. I was, you uh, bet. Uh, uh, I was in the Dubac's room once, 1970 or something like that, <laughs> and you know, and his room was just full of you know bookshelves everywhere and all sort of stuff. And the phone rings, so <laughs> so I get up to leave. No, no. You can stay there, you know. I hear this conversation. Uh, well, no, no, I really can't. I, I'm not well. I, I can't. I, no, I, sorry, I can't do it. So he hangs up. I said, what's that all about? He said, well, that was Cardinal Villot. Uh, he wants me to come to the initial meeting of the International Papal Theological Commission in Rome. But I, I really can't. I'm not feeling well. And I, I can't go alone. And no one to come to me. I said, well, I, I, I'll, I'll accompany you, you know. If you, you know. Oh, really? Would you? So he calls up the cardinal right there, you know. I can come, I can come. So I actually, I accompanied him to Rome uh, for this meeting of the Papal Theological Commission. And uh, it was phenomenal. He, uh, uh, we were walking down the street and this other priest came up who looked like a priest, but turns out he was Cardinal Boitiwa. And so, uh, oh, Father Dubac, you know, and and so I got introduced to Carla Boitiwa. who became John Paul too. Who became John on that trip, and then uh, because he was in Rome, he was asked to give a public talk at the uh, the French National Church uh, Saint Louis Saint Luigi is that it Saint Luigi yeah. Saint Luigi on Passa Navona. And so we go into this talk, and the little box is in me, and he's been sick. I, I've, I've had to kind of shepherd around town because he's getting out of bed, and he's very, very weak and everything. And I'm sitting between Hans Joseph Balthasar and Carol Wojtyla watching the give this talk. Wow. 
And he's at this table, and the talk is on the role of Peter and the early papacy in the church. And he's, you, you know, you can see he's, he's, his face is kind of bloodless. He's pale. He's been just, just been lying in bed in the after the afternoon. And he begins to talk about, you know, the role of Peter and the role of the papacy. And you can see the blood come back. It was like it was like watching the resurrection, you know. And uh, at the end, he, he's a very energetic person, you know, in his own way. He, he says, we've got to take, we have to take a walk. And so we, we leave the talk, we go out on the street. He turns to me, he says, J'ai fait mon devoir comme Jésuite, j'ai défendu le pape. I've done my duty as Jesuit, I've defended the Pope. Beautiful. Great man. At this point, I suspect, I suspect now, my, my, my problem now is I suspect that whatever is going to follow in the 10 minutes we have left is going to be an anticlimax. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful, actually, honestly, Father, that, that we, we were very privileged to be flies on the wall in those various moments you've accounted to us, which none of us would have known about. And I do hope that at some point somebody's recording all these stories that you have. Well, I think that this, this one, I think, is recorded somewhere. I think it's in my autobiography or my biography that's being published at some point. I wish there were more of that in your biography, but... Um, oh, yeah, maybe not. Yeah. All right, well... But, um, in any case, that was a fabulous in, uh, introduction to the man, Henri de Lubac, and as Father said, this work is our essays or talks he gave on Lumen Gentium, and... He had a role in the production of that document of the council, Lumen Gentium. Oh, that's right. I was going to say, if you look at Lumen Gentium and then look at the table of contents in this book, Spine of the Church, which was published way before, what's the first chapter? The Church's Mystery. And that's the Same as the first chapter of Lumen Gentium. What's the almost last chapter? Ecclesia Mater, the Church, Our Mother. And then the last chapter, the Church and Our Lady. I mean... This is, this is like the draft of Lumen Gentium. Right, right. And by the way, I really recommend everyone between now and our next session, if you have the chance, to read Lumen Gentium. I had never read it completely through until I was reading this book and realizing that these are what de Lubach himself calls marginal glosses. <laughs> so humble. Oh, this is just a marginal gloss on Lumen Gentium. And I said, all right, I've got to put this book down and go read Lumen Gentium and then come back if I, you know. So that's just what I did, and I'm so glad I did. It's a beautiful document. It is. So how do we start, Joseph? What do you want to do? Well, I mean, wherever you like, the first the first thing I have to highlight is on page 14, but I'm sure that most of you have something before that. Most of you, both of you. Well... Maybe on page nine, he begins his first chapter from paradox to mystery. And you, you kind of see what kind of theologian he was the way he begins, which is in thinking about the church as every Christian does in the course of his life, it can be good, particularly for a theologian, at least occasionally, to set aside critical studies, dot, 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 a few lines down, to rest in a contemplative gaze on the object of study, a gaze that is closer to what old and venerable tradition termed precisely theology. That is, you see that he's a man who, who, who writes, he's on his knees, he's, he's, he's in adoration, he's in contemplation. This is not just some kind of, uh, you know, footnoted critical apparatus with, uh, you know, historical critical, you know, comments. No, he, he, he's really a, a man of prayer and a man of contemplative gaze. And then he says at the close of that paragraph, before contemplating the mystery, we first need to meditate on the paradox. Yeah. And then he spells out what constitutes the paradox of the church, all of her seemingly contrasting features. Right, and in the middle of the next page, page 10, he says, the church, if I seek a glimpse of her, where will I find her? What are the features of her countenance? And you go, couple lines down, complexio oppositorum, that is, the, the gathering together of all these opposites. And that's that's a reference to Nicholas of Cusa, uh, who referred to reality and the church as a combination of opposites. And this is very important. 
this 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 comes through in Dulubach, in von Balthasar, in Ratzinger, and many others, is that syllogisms are important. Deductions from revealed truths are important. But there's a paradox in the church where you have to kind of realize there's there's competing views that are not oppositional, but they're complementary. And you have to bring them you have to bring them both into kind of dialectical. What does dialectic mean? Dialogue that you got two different Mm-hmm. Elements, two different perspectives. And uh, we'll see this later in this chapter and the next. What Balthasar calls Kreisen des Denken, circular thing. He, he likes to take the, the figure of David in, in, in Florence, in you know, San Marco, where you know Michelangelo is a statue of David. And you can't appreciate that from just one perfect. You got to walk around it, mm-hmm. you know, and you can't grasp all thing from one perspective. And that, that's what Balthasar Lubach is saying here. To understand the church, you know, we have to bring in many different views of it. And by the way, a little background too for our discussion. At the beginning of Lumen Gentium, as we'll see, there are many different images of the church mm-hmm. which are given. Body of Christ, spouse of Christ. House of the Lord, the altar of heaven, that sort of stuff, people of God. Well, after the council, there was kind of a fixation on the people of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'll see, as we go on here, that Delubach is going to offer a, a careful, balanced, mild criticism of those who simply take this as the only way of looking at the church. Something else we'll see here, I, you know, again, I found this in my relations with him, is that because while I was there, 69 or 70, he was still writing books. I remember this one book, uh, well, two books actually, but one of them, he uh, he was trying to show the unity of scripture and tradition. And so, in, and, the, and the, the, the mistakenness of this idea that we have two sources of revelation, scripture and tradition. He said, no, no, no. The scripture is part of tradition. And so it's one source, scripture. And so, the French title was L'Écriture dans la Tradition, Scripture and Tradition. And he showed me the English translation, the two sources, oh. Scripture and Tradition. So even though he was trying kind of gently to show the unity, it wasn't perceived. Well, we, we'd go through a book he'd written, I, and I'd read the thing, and uh, he'd have all these quotes from the fathers. And he said, well, th- this, is, this is my response to Father so-and-so. And this is my criticism of, of Father so so. I mean, he wouldn't come out and attack people. He would make statements and, ba- and back them up with the fathers of the church as a way of counteracting some false ideas that he encountered in, in these people. Anyway. If I may, I would like to just clarify something. You know, we've talked a lot about in our discussions the dangers of relativism, right? That well, my opinion is my opinion, your opinion is your opinion, your view, my view, different perspectives. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is because the object of contemplation itself is this, and when you brought the statue of the David into it, it just clicked for me. You, you, the viewer, can't see all of it all at once. You've got to walk around it to see the whole thing. And so... These different views, it's not like my looking at it is as good as anybody else's looking at it, and my therefore my opinion is as good as anybody else's opinion, but rather I need to literally walk around this entire thing because I can't see it all, all at once. That's what we mean by different views. And, 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 to see, and to see everybody's perspective of the objective reality, not correct. just their subjective perception of it so I, I and one thing i do i mean obviously we're coming to the end now of this session and it's been absolutely wonderful literally um but one thing i maybe we could kick off the next conversation with is is this called paradox of mystery now obviously i'm very much enamored of the idea of paradox being a chestertonium and an apparent contradiction applies to a deeper truth so maybe we can begin as both of you know the lubac much better than i do before we get into the text next time with um, um, how does 
paradox, this apparent contradiction that points to a deeper truth, lead us deeper into mystery? And what does the Lubach mean by paradox and mystery? Because I think that would allow us to establish uh, and define our terms as we move forward into the structure of all that follows. You might forget um, about that between now and next week. That's, that's, that's my suggestion. I, that's a great idea. Well, but I'd like to go a little bit further before we close. We have a couple more minutes here. Uh, because, you know, on page 10, I quoted, you know, what are the features of her countenance? And then he goes on page 11 to talk about those paradoxes. Last paragraph there. Human and divine, this earth and, and heaven, uh, past and future. But on the next page, the top, it says... Uh, Catholic, that is universal, she wishes her members to be open to everything, and yet she is full of herself only when she withdraws into the intimacy of her interior life into the science of adoration. So that's, and remember that this comes from adoration. But uh, the bottom, and this is crucial, Latin, new paragraph at the bottom. My gaze, however, has not deceived me. It has revealed something to me, something I knew already before I began, and that every reflection confirmed. I can sum it up in one word. The first, simplest, most childlike of words, the church is my mother. Later on, I mean the living church. And towards the bottom, the church is my mother. This is the way I first came to know the church. On the knees of my earthly mother. And this is the way that at every stage of my pilgrimage, through events and situations, and in long, and then in long, defy analysis, I have learned to recognize her better. So this beautiful idea that as a little child, he learns about the church as his mother on his mother's knees, and he never lost that as a theologian. I I um was also happy to see that on page fifteen, and I know that surpasses Joseph where you wanted to go first, but. He says, happy are those who from childhood who have learned to look on the church as a mother. Happier still are those who ex experience whatever it might have been has confirmed them in this truth. And so not everyone has the blessing of a mother who taught them the faith or introduced them to the church. And yet the church's mother to them as well, because by other paths in life and experiences in life, they too can be confirmed in this truth. I took great comfort in that for all of those out there who didn't have the kind of mother he must have had. What a wonderful woman she must have been. Yeah, and the fact that the church for, for the motherless children, so to speak, uh, yes. can become the mother. And we actually might get our first understanding of what maternal love is if we haven't been blessed with, with that good, healthy relationship. I was thankfully, but, you know, there are many people that weren't, and I know people that weren't, you know, that maybe that coming to the church and coming to understand the church is discovering the motherhood that they were deprived of when they needed it when they were children. Right. Let me close on one other anecdote, because when I, as a West Coast American cowboy background and so on, went to Europe, uh, it was too formal for me, you know. I mean, we, we're on a first name basis here. Hey, Joe. Hey, Sam. Father, Father Bill, whatever. And it, not that way among many in Europe. In fact, the language, you know, has the, the familiar form and the more formal form. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in French, it's, it's tu and it's vous. Uh, well, it turns out that I, f I found out that due to the Bach and his mother were always vous voyez. That is, really? they, they used the formal. They used the formal. And I experienced the Lubach talking to Balthasar and Rasher, and they always used to form with each other. Wow. But, they, but they were the closest of friends. They were very warm, you know, intimate friends. And yet there was a sense of dignity that was there. I, I mean, I, I don't have it myself, and I don't think I'd ever do it, but I admired it when I saw it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this great love for his mother and for the church, but it's not some kind of just mere sentimental love. It, it's, it's structured. It, it has a form to it, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to come back uh, next week. Hope you come back too, and we'll start getting further into the book. But uh, this is this is a worthwhile book to discuss and read. If you enjoyed this discussion, 
Please help spread the word about the Forum Book Club by subscribing to the podcast and writing a review. You can sign up for weekly updates at formedbookclub.ignatius.com.